two, three, a row, two, three. All right. Welcome back to the It's Only Rock and Roll Podcast. I'm your host, Don DiMuccio, and despite my prediction that I'd be arrested on Tuesday for crimes regarding my hush money payment to the estate of Betty White, I'm still here and ready to bring you another great interview from the world of rock and roll. I don't want to talk about it. But before we get into it, just a reminder that you can find past episodes of the show, including interviews with rock rates like Kenny Jones of The Faces and The Who, John Densmore and Robbie Krieger of The Doors, Linda Ronstadt, Rudy Sazo, Paul Schaefer, Dave Mason, Gina Shock of The Go-Go's, the list goes on and on. Just go to www.itsonlyrockandrollpodcast.com or find us on iTunes, YouTube, iHeartRadio, Spotify, TuneIn Radio, or on your favorite podcast app. You know, I first heard the name Tony King in reference to John Lennon as he helped promote John's Mind Games and Walls and Bridges albums. As a matter of fact, if you've ever seen or heard any of the commercials Apple did for Mind Games with someone in drag playing the Queen, that was Tony. Later, I saw him in a Rolling Stones documentary of their Licks tour, where he worked as their press liaison, and he's been with them on all their tours, starting with Steel Wheels in 1989. Now, that alone would be a satisfying career for anyone, but for Tony King... It's but a few examples of an illustrious and sometimes volatile life in the business of rock. Ladies and gentlemen, Her Royal Highness, the Queen. Good evening. I've been asked to do this commercial. It relates to a gramophone record (laughs) called Mind Games by John Lennon. Today's guest has been called rock and roll's best kept secret. For almost the entire stretch of the genre's existence, he's worked behind the scenes in a career that started at the age of 16, working for Decca Records, and in short order parlayed his natural born wit, charm, and intelligence into seven decades of looking after the careers of artists like Phil Spector, Roy Orbison, Brenda Lee, The Rolling Stones, Elton John, and most famously John Lennon during Lennon's so-called Lost Weekend period, which proved to be his most commercially successful, in large part thanks to this man. Please welcome to the It's Only Rock and Roll podcast, author of The Tastemaker, My Life with the Legends and Geniuses of Rock Music, Tony King. Hello, Tony. Good afternoon. How are you? Um, it's good afternoon here anyway. <laughs> well, it's late morning here. Good afternoon and happy belated birthday. Thank you. Yeah, this week. I had a nice week, actually. Did you? Yeah, I saw um, my goddaughter last weekend. She's Charlie Watts' daughter. Serafina? Serafina, yeah. I had a lunch with Serafina last Sunday in the country with her husband. And then I had dinner with my friends on the actual birthday. And then I had a, a very nice lunch on Thursday with friends from Universal uh, who I've worked with in the past. So it was a, it was a very nice. Lots of flowers. So it looks like Judy Garland's dressing room here. <laughs> And now you got to finish up with me. All good things come to an end. <laughs> now, where exactly in the UK are you? Uh, London, in, in a very nice part of London called Primrose Hill, which is north London, north of Baker Street, close to central London, four stops on the tube. But I'm right next to a beautiful park, and we've got this little community around here that we call Primrose Hill Village restaurants bookstore carrying my book thank goodness and you know just it's just a very nice area to live in london it's like living in the country in london and funny enough you know when i'm here i feel like i'm not really in london but when i go to london i just jump in a car or uber and go in you know i have to because i don't walk too swiftly so i take ubers Well, you mentioned your book, and I want to congratulate you on just a fantastic new memoir. You know, any fan of British rock will appreciate every page. By definition, the work you do kind of made you a behind-the-scenes man. You know, what made you want to come out with this book now, putting yourself front and center? Well, I mean, if I was ever going to do it, now was the time, to be honest with you. I never wanted it to do it before because I felt like I was still living it. And then all of a sudden, along came lockdown and COVID. And like many other people, our careers changed. I was working on Elton's tour. The tour got held up. I was then no longer really working. And I I was at a loose end. And a friend of mine said, well, if you don't do it now, you'll never do it. Yes. I said, okay, I'm going to try. And so I did. You know, I just it just so happened that things fell into place, as it were. Had you thought of it beforehand? Well, I've been approached by so many people over the years. Excuse me, I'm drinking a cup of tea while we talk. 
No um, problem. I've been approached by a lot of people over the years, and I had resisted it because the thing was I was a bit nervous about doing something that would prove to be unkind or or gossipy or in any way not nice to people that I'd worked with and I didn't want to do that you know so when when Faber and Faber offered me the chance to do this book I made it quite clear that it was not going to be a gossip memoir and it wasn't going to be dishing the dirt or any of that it was going to be much more you know not like that and, my, and I had enough interesting things to say I didn't have to say that kind of shit you no know? no and you were pretty frank in it. Didn't seem like you were holding back. Yeah, I, I, I think the book is pretty honest, regardless of of any kind of gossip stuff, you know. Because the thing is, I said to the ghostwriter Tom, who was so wonderful, and I said to him, "Look, Tom, if I'm going to do this one time in my life, I want to do it cards on table about myself. I want to be very honest." And I want to write like a sort of almost like an adventure story. And the adventure is my adventure. And all the people that I work for are part of the adventure. You know, it's the journey through the decades and the people I work with during those decades and the experiences I had with them and the experiences I had with myself. And so if I have been gossipy at all, it's been about myself to say certain things. You know, some of my friends are going, oh, I didn't know that about you, you know, and <laughs> they've been a bit surprised. Well, as we said, you you know, you had a birthday last week and you were born at a time during the war and it puts you in that sweet spot where you were able to experience rock and roll right from day one. Yeah, and it's funny you should say that because I'm reading this book by a guy called Bob Stanley, who's a genius writer and they, they Mick Jagger for Christmas gave me this book of his for Christmas and it was so great that I got his follow-up which was a book called Yeah 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 which got the Sunday Times Music Book of the Year award and I've just started reading it and I'm just in the chapters now where rock and roll starts up from and you know the early Sun Sam Phillips Sun records and all the early Elvis stuff before he went to RCA and Jerry Lee Lewis and all the early rockers, you know. And it's so interesting because the credit that Bob Stanley gives is, although Elvis was, of course, so influential in all our lives, of those of us who were around at the time, the other person who was actually, in a funny kind of way, slightly more ahead of it was Bill Haley and Bill Haley and the Comets. Mm. Was Rock Around the Clock was 1955, and Heartbreak Hotel was not till 1956. So Bill Haley was the first person to make rock and roll records and create a youth culture, and there were all sorts of rock and roll riots at the showing of that film. And in America, it got banned in quite a few places because of that, because right. of rioting. So it's quite interesting to read about Bill Haley and. Uh, of course, one must pay credit to Bill Haley because he made some great rock and roll records. See you later, Alligator, Rip, you know, things like that. You know, he just made some great records. And so I I, I, I tip my hat to Bill Haley today. <laughs> but Bill Haley wasn't your first introduction, was it? No. Well, it was at home, yeah, along with everybody else. But the person who really affected me was Elvis. I mean, straight away. I mean, Bill Haley was great. He made very commercial records, but he looked like he should be selling insurance in a funny kind of way. <laughs> you know, yeah, it, yeah. It just, he just wasn't the right kind of guy. And then all of a sudden, this amazing record came on the radio. And I thought, what is that? Who is that? What's that sound? And I found out it was this man called Elvis Presley who just had a gold record for Heartbreak Hotel. And then I started looking at photographs of him and I thought, oh, my God, he's beautiful. He looks like James Dean. He's, you know, he, he fitted the the time because there was James Dean, there was Marlon Brando and everybody who was like a lead actor or whatever, they all had a certain look. 
And mm. so Elvis had that look. He had a great look about him, you know. And not only was he a great looking guy, he was a mover, you know, and he did all these controversial movements that got him only filmed from the waist up on the Ed Sullivan show. You know, they wouldn't show him from the waist down because he did all these so-called suggestive movements. And so Elvis was just like, he set the whole youth culture thing going, really. I mean, that was it. Once we heard Elvis, we were off to the races, many of us, you know. That brings up an interesting point. Obviously, you didn't have Ed Sullivan in the UK. When was the first time that you actually saw him move? Oh, it was a long time. I had to put on newspaper stories and magazine stories for many years because we didn't have YouTube or anything like that then. So it wasn't easy to access visuals of people you know unless you saw jailhouse rock or love me tender oh that's right yeah so the only way to really see elvis at that time i didn't see ed sullivan i didn't see the jimmy dorsey and tommy dorsey shows which are actually better than the ed sullivan yes they are yeah the jimmy dorsey tommy dorsey with the band are fantastic and uh, i mean that was the best we i didn't get to see that for years so I had to make do with Jailhouse Rock, which wasn't the real thing. You know, it was just Elvis acting. And although he did do a great version of Jailhouse Rock in the movie and, and his movements were good. But um, I really wanted to see Elvis. Ideally, if I had ch could chose a moment to see Elvis, it would be a L Louisiana Hayride. Oh, sure. You know, just in the very early stages of his career when he was, you know, he was just make, making it, making great records and, and still not a star, but very much a star on, on the road, you know. According to your book, I know you weren't a fan of school. Kind of interesting that your parents actually let you drop out because I guess in England it was 16 was the cutoff age, but you did thrive working at a record store. Talk about that a little bit. I mean, you know, I worked in the record store Saturday and then the guy in the record store had a job at Decker. He was the head of the, the what they call the sleeve department, which made all the record covers for the albums. And he offered me a job. So I had to go back to my mum and dad, who were my, in fact, my grandparents and say, look, I'm really desperate to leave school. I want to start and they get, I want to take this job I've been offered in the record company. And I think for a quiet life, they just said, okay you know and so i got the job and then i started working in london i was living in eastbourne which is a seaside town and i would travel up to london every day i mean it would an hour and a half train ride to get to london and then a 25 minute walk to work so it was two hours in the morning and two hours in the evening longer in the evening because i didn't get the train till 6 45 and got home at hoppers between hopper state and nine and mum had her dinner in the oven and I would take my dinner and go to bed and get up early and do the same thing the next day. But I loved it. I was just happy to be working in a record company. And everybody in the record company got to know me very quickly because I was a very bright kid. Well, I wasn't a kid. I was 16, but I was a bright young man. And everybody knew me as a very bright young man. And I got offered jobs very quickly in the record company. And I very quickly became an assistant label manager for London American Records. And so I was off to the races quite fast, you know, because there weren't a lot of young people around at that time who had the enthusiasm and the knowledge that I had because I really studied the American charts. I lived by the American charts the whole time. I used to go to the library and look up the new Musical Express charts on Fridays and check which were, what were the new records in the charts in America and try and imagine what they were like. You know, sometimes I got it right, sometimes I got it hopelessly wrong. <laughs> And because of that, you were picking tracks for EPs. Well, Jeff Milne was the he head of London American, and Jeff realized very quickly that I was kind of bright, and he gave me the job of preparing EPs. And so I did. I did a Fats Domino. I did a Little Richard. I did an Everly Brothers one. I did a Jerry Lee Lewis one, you know. And they they were very successful. I I, I picked four or five songs, usually four, uh, that were popular of each artist and put them in a really nice package and i'm so regret that i sold them off to somebody you know uh -huh. i wish i still had them but anyway i did them and they were very successful and you know but i i i had no idea about what that meant to tell you the truth i was 17 18 years old 16 17 and i was doing this and i was just doing it because i knew i could i didn't look around and think oh how wonderful i am i just did it you know I did, right I, idea it was going to be successful and it was 
I want to ask you about the first time you met the Beatles. Yeah. Um, but I imagine you'd heard their song, their first release in England, Love Me Do. What did the young Tony King think of it before actually meeting well, them? Up until then, it was all about American music for me. You know, and even the British counterparts who were doing well, you know, Cliff Richard, Marty Wilde, Billy Fury, all those English artists who were do making hits, it was never my thing, you know. But when I heard Love Me Do, I thought, oh, I love the sound of that. They sound kind of different, you know. You know, I just thought, what a great sounding record it was. And then I was working at Decca looking after American artists who came to London. And I used to have to take them out uh, to do all their press and radio and TV and also take them out for dinner. So I got to know Roy Orbison and Johnny Tillotson and Brenda Lee and Neil Sadaka and Della Reese and Dwayne Eddy, all these people. And one of the jobs was to take an artist you were looking after down to this show called Pop In, where artists literally popped in and played their latest record. And I was there with Chris Montez, who had a record called Let's Dance. And we were in the what they call the green room, where all the artists hang out before they go on. And in come these four guys. And I looked at them and I thought, wow, what kind of energy these guys have. They, they filled the room with their energy and particularly John Lennon, because I looked at him and I thought, wow, he's some character, this one. You know, it was something very, very, he had a lot of powerful energy, John Lennon did. Yeah. They all collectively, and I got chatting to them, and I found out that we were all in love with American music. We all we were swapping notes about songs that we like, and George and Ringo were really keen on that. And I, I said, well, you know, I, I pick up a lot of American records, and I can always drop them, because I knew where the, they were living on Green Street, where Tony Hall, my boss, was living. And I said, I can drop stuff off for you. And they said, oh, yeah, would you do that? And I said, yeah. And I used to pick up Motown records for them, you know, You Beat Me to the Punch, Do You Love Me, you know, Stubborn Kind of Fellow, those early Motown records. And I would drop them off to their flat in Green Street. But we got friendly straight away and I stayed friends with them throughout, you know, because they, they recognised me almost as one of the gang, if you like. You know, they knew that I was loved the same music they did and I just got to know them and I got to know their wives very well. In fact, I'm seeing Patty on Thursday. She's coming over for a cup of tea on Thursday, Patty Harrison. Sure. Uh, and so, I, I, yeah, I became part of the gang and I went out clubbing with them and... We did all kinds of stuff together. It was really good fun. There's an interesting dynamic that you mentioned in the book. They dominated those early package tours, so much so that the headliners, like Chris Montez and even Roy Orbison, they'd end up swapping billing out of necessity because the crowd was so much there to see the Beatles. Well, the Chris Montez was a swap. The Roy Orbison was not because Roy was told that the Beatles were going to be at the top. And he said, what's a Beatle? <laughs> and uh, he was told who they were. But the thing about Roy is, even though he was not top of the bill, he still got the most amazing ovation because people didn't realize how great he was until he came on and started singing. And that voice was so powerful that the Beatles used to stand in the wings and watch him sing because they were so impressed with him you know Roy was really special and you mentioned he had a, a technique he didn't try to outdo them he didn't try to outplay them he did the opposite and played very quietly and got the audience's attention yeah he was just he Roy didn't know how to move it wasn't in his his you know his, he, he he just wasn't an artist who moved about on stage it wasn't part of his routine he was a, a person who stood still and sang very slowly and if you see film of him he hardly moves his mouth either only but these incredible notes come out he just had a great charisma you know fantastic charisma and was a lovely person on top of everything else. It was a really delightful person. I loved working with him. We we got on really, really well. And I knew his wife, Claudette, and his little boy, Roy Duane, who I used to take to the zoo. And I was quite friendly with the whole Orbison family. And then, unfortunately, Claudette got killed in a motorbike accident and Roy Duane got burned in a fire in his house. Awful tragedy. Two of his boys got burned to death, unfortunately. It was a horrible thing to say, but that's what happened. I know. Yeah. 
upset me because I love Roy Dwayne. I used to take him to the zoo and he was very fond of me. And Claudette said, oh, he really loves you. Uh, Sad. Uh, Did you help Roy get his dream car? His car? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> what was that about? We were going down the King's Road, which is in Chelsea, in a taxi. And um, I knew Roy liked the German general's cars, the Mercedes with the running boards and the spotlight headlights. I, I knew that he had a, a liking for them because we had talked about it in conversation, I think. And then all of a sudden we're going down the King's Road and we were going for dinner and one of these cars pulled out from the side street and Roy looked at this car out the window and he said, I have to have that car. He said, can you do anything about getting it for me? And I said, well... Let's stop the taxi first. So we stopped the taxi. I jumped out. A guy was behind us. I flagged him down. And I, I guess he was wondering what the hell was going on. But he was very nice. And I, I wound down the window and I said, sorry to bother you, but I'm just wondering if you'd be at all interested in selling your car. <laughs> so he said, well, I could be. Why do you ask? And I said, well, I've got someone in the taxi who wants to buy it. And he said, well, let's talk so i got roy and i said he wants to talk roy so roy came out and discussed it with him and before you knew where we are we went off for dinner and roy had struck up a deal to buy this guy's car and he bought the car and all the spare parts and it was all shipped to nashville wow i've told this story a hundred times but i have to tell it again a few years later i bumped into barbara orbison at the rock and roll hall of fame by which time roy had died sadly and Barbara was there and she didn't know me and I didn't know her. But I walked over to the table and I said, excuse me. I said, you don't know me. My name's Tony King. She said, you're Tony King. I said, yeah. She said, you were a very, very famous man in our house. She said, Roy used to love to tell the story about you and the car and how you got him his dream car. She, and and then when, when BBC did a, a lovely documentary on Roy and, and his trips to England, and she asked if I would do a talk about Claudette and the boys and everything at the time. So I did. I did a lovely piece for it, actually. Of, of all the little TV things I've done, that was my favourite one. Because I, I, I spoke very honestly. And I was very moved when I was talking about it, you know. Sure. Something about Roy Orbison always struck me is that he was a great man, like you said. Lovely, good, fantastic man, gentleman. No ego, because so many of those early rockers, from Elvis to Chuck Berry to Little Richard, you could just tell that they were intimidated or insecure by what came after them in the 60s. And Roy wasn't I, I, like that at all. I guess really, in a way, it was a, some kind of artistic jealousy that happens sometimes you know when along comes a new wave of people who are taking all the airtime and the press time and everything there's always sometimes there's a little element of artistic jealousy about that i think you know? sure but sure sure i think it's very normal and i think it happens there's always a rival like everybody you you take an, an artist and they've always got a rival who they're playing up against you know right <laughs> Now, I know you were at the famous recording session for All You Need Is Love. What other sessions of the Beatles did you sit in? Well, I didn't sit in a lot because I didn't particularly like the studio. I wasn't never a fan of the studio because it always was a place for me where I had nothing to do. You know, I wasn't a producer and I wasn't a singer. And so I, I used to find it kind of, I didn't want to be there very long, even though it was maybe a really good time to be there. But to be honest with you, I was, I don't mean this to sound conceited, but I was so used to the Beatles because I was around London and within their group that went out and had fun and did stuff. Sure. I wasn't sort of like bowled over by seeing them in the studio. I just went down there mainly because I was working for George Martin. And so I said, oh, I'll pop down tonight. And George said, oh, you must come by. We're, we're doing some nice sessions. So I said, yeah, I'll pop by. So I popped by when they were doing Lovely Rita. And then when they were doing the White Album, I think I popped in for Bungalow Bill. And uh, I think I went in... But Abbey Road when they were doing an in, they were doing some kind of instrumental stuff. Mm. But I didn't I never I never hung around lots. I just would pop in and sit for a, an hour or two and then then I'd go home. <laughs> I can understand that. 
it just, makes sense just i mean i wasn't bored but i had nothing to do except sit there you know george was busy working chris thomas was busy working right all the engineers were busy doing their jobs and people in the studio were busy playing and singing and i'm just sitting there you know so i don't want to sit there for too long you know i'm looking at my watch thinking time to go home yeah right but, you mentioned working for george martin at air london what did you do there specifically well, George had a company, a production company, with four independent producers, Ron Richards, John Burgess, and Peter Sullivan. And they, between them, they produced a lot of artists. The Hollies, the Manfred Mann, Tom Jones, Engelbert, Stella Black, Beatles. And I was responsible for plugging their records when they came out to making sure they got good airtime. And I also looked after their publishing company. They had a publishing company called Grouto, which was tied up with the Hollies. And Grouto Music was in Dick James' office. And so I got an office in Dick James' office because Air London, George's company, had a, a nice office in Baker Street, but they didn't have room for me. So they put me for a while in Dick James' office, which was fortunate because that's where I met Elton, of course. Right. He was Reg Dwight when he was a session player, and I met him there. If I hadn't have been in Dick James' office, we would have never have met. So it was all very fortunate. And um, I stayed in Dick's office for a couple of years, and then Air, Air bought a very nice house in Park Street, and I got my own office, and so I moved in with everybody else. Talk about how you did eventually work for Elton in those early days. Well, I didn't work for him straight away. I mean, when I first met Elton, his name was Reg, and he was a session player and a songwriter, and we got friendly because we both loved music. Again, same thing as the Beatles. Sure. We talked music. We talked a lot about what records we were liking, what records we were getting, because I used to get a lot of American records, and Elton used to be very curious about the records I used to get. He said, well, what's that? What's that? What's that? And... Um, and then gradually, uh, I got him session work. He played on He Ain't Heavy, He's My Brother. I got him that job. And I got him a couple of other session jo jobs. And he got he got lots of work all over town. He was a session musician, and he was playing on lots of people's sessions. But then all of a sudden, he decided he wanted to make a record under his own name. So he made his first album called Empty Sky, which was a, m a moderate success, but it was a success enough that it launched him. And it had a song on it, a very beautiful song called Skyline Pigeon, mm -hmm. which was, you know, I think the first Elton song that I, I really took notice of. And I suddenly thought, oh, that's a beautiful song. And then, of course, he went and made the second album, which became the one with your song on it. And then he went off to America. I mean, but by this, this time, I'm still knowing him. And he, we, we're, st we're still at the Reg and Tony stage. We hadn't crossed into the Elton stage yet. Right. But he went off to America. And then he got this incredible review at the Troubadour from Robert Hilburn and became a huge star in America. And then came back to England and said to me, oh, it went so well. And well, I'm playing the, the Hampstead Country Club tonight. Do you want to come down and watch? So I said, sure. So I went down to watch him and he was like jumping on the piano, kicking the piano stool back and had a pair of shorts on and wing boots and everything. And I went, well, hello, what happened? <laughs> and I said to him, you've actually morphed into Elton John. You've become Elton John. And from that point on, I knew he was Elton. And he asked me if I would then from that point on call him Elton. And I did, you know, eventually, and not after a couple of weeks I did. The first couple of weeks I was, you know, it was a bit shy to say it. But then finally I just got, he He was so Elton that it, there was no other, no other name to call him, to quite honestly. <laughs> right, right. And then we, you know, obviously he started to make loads and loads of hits. I was working at Apple, the Beatles company. I was working for Ringo and John at Apple in London. And... Elton used to come in all the time and we'd go out for lunch and he used to come in and play me his latest records, uh, the singles that he'd made and he would come in and then one day he came in and he said, oh, I've got my new record, you want to hear it? And I said, yeah, and he played me Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me and I said, oh, wow, that's such a great song. He said, you really like it? I said, yes, I do, I love it. He said, I wasn't crazy about it. So I said, are you serious? And he said, no, I, I wasn't, I didn't think it was necessarily a single. We were in Apple and I and Ringo had a design company on the first floor and he was in that day. I said, do you want to go up and play it to Ringo and see what he says? So he said, yeah. So he, I took him up to Ringo's office 
and we played it and Ringo said to him it's a smash Elton you you can't look at it any other way right and he realized that he had a hit on his hands and so I spent a lot of time with Elton when he was got first successful we used to go out a lot together we used to go to gigs we used to go to movies I used to go and stay with him at weekends you know we became great friends because he was also gay but he never said it at the time I mean everybody knew I was gay there was no secret there you know yeah Holly Watts said I was the gayest person he'd ever met and I don't know why he would say that because I wasn't <laughs> I was gay but I wasn't you know anyway um but Elton and I had had a friendship which incorporated that of course you know not a, we were never boyfriends but we were always great friends you know so there you go you mentioned Mark Boland in the book wasn't he around that time around Apple Mark used to come in a lot because he was very friendly with Ringo and I think he wrote a song for Ringo's second solo album or I think it was was it called Snookaroo or something no oh, Harry Nilsson wrote that no who wrote who wrote the Mark but what did Mark Boland was it write? was it I think he inspired Back Off Boogaloo Back Off Boogaloo yeah that's right that's the one oh Snookaroo was Harry Nilsson very clever very well <laughs> done for that one I've forgotten that uh but back off boogaloo definitely was an inspiration and mark used to come into the office a lot and he had this in rather posh wife called june who elton and i adored because june was so so straightforward and spoke like that and you know if elton had some outrageous outfit on she'd say oh elton can't possibly go out dressed like that <laughs> she was always she was fantastic we loved her but mark was lovely he used to come into the office a lot kind of timid he was never showing off or anything he was always slightly shy and very sweet and Elton and I see him quite a lot we'd have dinner with him in June quite a bit they come down when I went down there for the weekend sometimes they'd be they'd come over for dinner and we 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 had a lot of social time together and they were fun they were really great fun of course and Mark made great records you know he made fabulous records at that time and he was a big big star in England he started out being T-Rex and then he became then he just made all these wonderful hits you know bang a gong you know which was which he got Elton to play on on the TV show Top of the Pops right him singing it and Elton playing the piano and Elton's in the movie too uh Born to Boogie yeah yeah I forgot those things actually you know what I do <laughs> it's a shame Boland didn't break into America bigger because I mean he only had the one hit here really yeah, he was never big in America was he really no it's unfortunate what was what what was the record that made it in America bang a gong yeah bang a gong yep, Still yep. A good record. <laughs> that's a great great record now you eventually left England moved to America and it was John Lennon yeah who precipitated that yeah John definitely well I went to America in the end of 73 to help out with the first Ringo Starr album the solo one the one that Richard Perry produced yes and they were in a bit of a muddle over at Capitol about artwork and tapes and recordings and they needed someone to pull it all together and a guy at Capitol called Dennis Colleen had previously been to Apple and had gotten to know me and he realized that I was you know reasonably bright and uh, he said to Capital, well, there's a guy in London who I think we should get over. I think he can do the job. So I was called to America, to L LA, to do the Ringo album, and I pulled it all together. It was quite difficult because there was a 12 page booklet that Klaus Vormann had done drawings for, and I had to trace all the drawings and drive all around the hills of Hollywood to pull it all together. But I did it and the uh, and it was all done and it came out on time and Capital were very happy with me and I was getting ready to go home and then I get a call from May Pang who at that point in my mind was John and Yoko's private secretary right and she said uh John and I are coming to LA tomorrow and he wants you to wait because he would like you to work on his album like you've just done for Ringo and I said okay now at this point I wasn't exactly excited about that because I was always nervous of John because he was so sharp and quick-witted and everything and I wasn't quite sure about how that was going to work out but anyway the next night I went to see him for dinner and he was lovely he was charming and we got on really really well and we had a great time and a great conversation even though I couldn't park the car to go into the restaurant I was struggling to park this T-Bird and John was looking at me and he said what's the matter and I said I can't pop the car John 
<laughs> and he said, how come? And he said, I said, because you're in it. Would you please go in the restaurant and take your seat in my name and then I'll come in when I park the car. So I did. And that made John laugh. And then we became good friends. And I worked on his Mind Games album for the next couple of months and got him to do all kinds of press and stuff, which he hadn't done in years. And he really enjoyed working with me. And then one night in the Roxy, we were sitting in the Roxy, which is Lou Adler's place on Sunset Boulevard, Sunset Strip, actually. Above, it was on the rocks, above the Roxy, the club called On the Rocks. And he leaned across the table and he said, I'd like you to come and work for me in America. And I said, when? And he said, well, as soon as we can get a visa for you. So I thought about it. I was of two minds about it. I didn't know. I said, well, you know. Uh, by the, which time I had introduced him to Elton and he said to Elton, just tell your friend to get off his ass and come and work for me in America. <laughs> so I eventually did. The following year I came um work for John in America, which I did. I sailed to America on the SS France with Elton and the band and I met John. And by which time, by the way, when, when John arrived in L.A., going back to the, the 73, I realised that he and May were having an affair. Yeah. And he told me afterwards that he and Yoko were taking a break and that he was with May and uh, it was with Yoko's full approval. And so he was with May and they were very sweet together. May was very helpful to me. She helped me do a lot of things. She was really nice and she got on well with me and she was very good with John. She was she was a really very, very sweet girl. I'm still in touch with her. And she got a lot of the photos are in my book of May's pictures. Sure. Then we now fast forward to 74 and I come to America on the SS France and we see John in the Pierre Hotel. Elton and I were in the Pierre. We go up to John, he plays his album, Walls and Bridges, and he said, do you want to sing on something? And Elton said to me, what do you think? And I said, well, the one that's obvious is whatever you get you through the night, really, isn't it? And he said, yeah, that's what I thought. So we said to John, how about that? And he said, yeah, come down to the studio in three nights time and do it, which we did. You know, we had some stuff to do. Elton had some stuff to do with MCA. And I was just having fun being in America, living back. In, you know, I was I was all excited because I was living in America now. And um, we went to the studio. We did whatever gets you through the night. And then I went back to L.A. Elton went back on the road. John stayed in New York with May. And I think he came back to L.A. with May afterwards as well. And then um, it became a hit. And uh, during the course of it becoming a hit, Elton called me up and said, do you think John would do Madison Square Garden with me? Because he was on tour doing his Goodbye Yellow Brick Road tour. Not the Farewell Yellow Brick Road, the first Yellow Brick Road tour. Right. So I said, well, let me ask him. So I said to John Elton, would like to know if you would do Madison Square Garden. And he said, well, if the record gets to number one, I'll do it. And so the record got to number one, <laughs> but for one week. But I called up John. I said, guess what, John, it's number one. He said, does that mean I've got to do Madison Square Garden? I said, well, <laughs> only that you said you would. And he said, well, then I'll do it. So I told Elton, I said, he's up for it. So we went up to Boston to see Elton's show so that John could get an idea of what he was letting himself in for. He was very impressed with it. He loved the sound. He said, oh, this is... Then we did rehearsals in New York at the record plant with Jimmy Iovine and Roy Sakala. And then along comes Thanksgiving night, 1974, and they did the show together. John came on to an ovation like I've never heard before and I've never heard since. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of exaggeration in rock and roll, but I've heard from many people who were there said the rumbling, the excitement when John took that stage. I mean, it, I think some people knew that it, it wasn't a total secret that he was going to appear. I think it was going around New York a little bit. Yeah. But I it, don't think the majority of the people knew. No. But I did a podcast uh, a week or so ago with some of the Studio 54 people. And Mark, the doorman at 54, he was at the show and he said he'd never heard an ovation like it. Anybody who was at that show will tell you the same thing. There was never an ovation like it, ever. I've never heard an ovation like it before or since. Uh, never. And nor has Elton. He said, of all the shows that he's done, that's the one that will always stand out in his mind. And it was an epic, epic night. You know, there's no other way to describe it. 
And it was so glorious to see John enjoying himself, feeling his oats and knowing he was back at the top of his game with this major artist who was also at the top of his game. You right. know? And it was just a glorious celebration. And I was so proud to have been involved in it. And I still am. It's the proudest moment of my career, really. To well, it's, it's no accident that you started the book off with it. You should be proud because people forget now that commercial wise, John Lennon's career was the least successful of all the four Beatles. He only had one number one hit in the United States in his lifetime. And everything we're talking about, you are partly responsible. You certainly made it happen and you should be proud of that. It's amazing. I am. I'm very proud of it. And along with that, I'm proud with doing Elton's Las Vegas show which was many, many years later. But I looked at the Las Vegas show when it was done, and I was very proud of that too. I thought, wow, that's another feather in my cap. But nothing really would ever replace the John and Elton night no. because of the atmosphere and the excitement. And I was, just, I was just so happy to see him looking so happy. Sure. I could spend the next 10 days talking about John Lennon, but I've got to bring up the Rolling Stones because you worked 20 years with them. Well, I knew the Stones back in the 60s when I worked with Andrew Oldham. And I worked with Andrew when he had just made Satisfaction. And I stayed with the Stones right up till Paint It Black. And then after that, I went to George Martin. So I knew them from the early days. And again, like the Beatles, we all used to hang out together. We got, The Beatles and the Stones and the Animals and the Small Faces and all the London bands We'd all hang out together at the Scottish St. James, you know. We'd all be there, all the bands. And there was no competition. All the bands just got along. Everybody was having a good time. Everyone was making money. Everyone was buying cars and houses, having a fine old time. So we were all, we were all great, you know. And um, it, was, it was such a fun time. But uh, the Stones were part of that, of course. But then later on, when I came back to work for them, many, many years later, it was a different time, you know, and I worked with Mick uh, initially on his solo album, She's the Boss. Right. And then Primitive Call, his follow up. And then I crossed over and worked for the Stones. At first, I didn't know whether I was going to be able to work with the Stones because I wasn't sure whether Keith would approve. Hey, Keith was a bit cross with me for working with Mick. He chastised me for it. He said to me, why are you doing this? And I said, you know what, Keith, it's a job. <laughs> it's right. a job and it's a good job. And I was I'm looking, I was looking for a job and it was a, one that came along that appealed to me and I, one that I knew I could do. And we should say this was during a tumultuous period for the Stones, the mid-80s, around the you time know, of dirty was, work. Was. Charlie was on heroin and, you mm. know, there was a lot of stuff going on that wasn't good. And the Stones couldn't work together. So we did a couple of solo tours with Mick. I did um, when we went to Japan and then we went to Australia. Talk about Jakarta. That was an experience, huh? Oh, Jakarta was a nightmare. <laughs> was kidding? that the worst experience you ever had as a professional? Well, it was the most threatening experience I've ever had. I mean, dealing with the hunter in Jakarta was no, no laughs. They called us in for a meeting and they were all sitting there looking like hardened criminals almost, you know, and gave us strict instructions about what we were, what we were expected to do, like drive to this place where we had to entertain invalid people, do the bicycle race like the Tour de France, and we had to do the Tour de Chicago, and, oh, and that, during which I got my pocket picked because we got jammed into this crowd and I could feel these hands all over my body. And then when I went to my pockets, everything had gone, my hotel keys, my money, everything gone. And then we did the show. And during the course of the show, it was I mean, getting the show together was a nightmare because they had to make the stage out of bamboo and things. It was, oh, I can't tell you what, what it was. It was, and Bill Graham was running it at the time. And it was, it was very difficult. And then the night of the show, there was a riot outside of the stadium for people who couldn't afford to come into the show. So they set tires on fire and there was all this black smoke coming up above the stadium. And <laughs> Prince Rupert, who looked after the Stones affairs, very rather grand man, was sitting out at the sound booth with Tony Blanc, who did the sound and myself. And he said, oh, you see that smoke? And I said, yes, Rupert. And he said, I think I'd better go back to the dressing room. And I said, you don't go anywhere until I get you an escort, Rupert. 
just right. stay where you are. And I called the security guys and I said, would you please escort this gentleman back to the dressing rooms and make sure he gets there safely? And they did. There was about six of them and they took him backstage, during which time there was a riot and the, all the people from the outside broke in and there was a riot at the back end of the field and they were robbing the concession stands and everything. It was, oh, it was chaos. It was absolute chaos. And the stones were out, were far down the front and they didn't know what was going on at the back, really. And not until after the show when I said to Mick, you have no idea what was going on. And then the next day, they had to cop up some money before they would let our plane leave. They had some, the promoter had to cop up some money and then we were allowed to leave. We all just sat on the plane waiting to know whether we were going to be allowed to leave. And finally we did. So, that reminds yeah. me of what happened to the Beatles in the Philippines. Similar yeah, situation. Kind of, kind of similar. They insulted Im Imelda, didn't they? Yes, they did. That's just an excuse, I think. They were just... Right, behaving hunterish. <laughs> yeah, you're right. A bit like if you went to Russia now, you know, you did get the same treatment. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of thugs, there's a great little story about Donald Trump related to the Stones. Oh, well, that was when we did... Um, Steel Wheels. Steel Wheels, and we were doing the pay-per-view show at the Atlantic Casino, whatever it was called, owned by Donald Trump. But we were renting the theatre space for the show. You know, as you do, a promoter goes in and does a deal, and theatre is yours for the evening. Right. You've paid your money, and you're going to do the show. And now you were going to do a press conference for the pay-per-view, you know, because there was Axel Rose, and there was Eric Clapton, and there was, I think it was Bo Diddley. Um, uh, John Lee Hooker. John Lee Hooker, thank you. Yep. well done. Thank you very much, John Lee Hooker. This man knows it all. And um, we were going to do a press conference, and Donald Trump was trying to elbow his way into the press conference, and we said to Donald Trump, you cannot come up on Stone's press conference. So during the course of the conference, he walked in with Marla Maples, who was then his second wife, and he stood at the back with that look, you know, that Trump, sulky mm -hmm. kind of trump look and his arms folded and i was sitting about 10 feet away from him and i looked at him and he was standing there in that awful threatening way and i thought my god what a jerk you are and uh, <laughs> i had no idea at that time what that he was going to become the president of america but i still maintain he was a jerk <laughs> yeah 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 of, of all the things that you did with the stones what was the highlight for you the highlight. Wow, that's a really good one. Um, wow. With when I was working with them. Yeah, that 20 year period. Well, there were two highlights. The Rio concert on the beach was fantastic. Oh, yeah. Like a million and a half people or something like that. Is that Copacabana Beach, I think? Yeah, yeah, Copacabana Beach was fantastic. It was amazing. That was a highlight. But for me, one of the highlights was when we all did, and Mick and Keith did the concert for 9-11. Oh, yeah. When Mick and Keith did Salt of the Earth. Yep. Such a beautiful song, such a great choice. And Elton did Mona Lisa's and Mad Hatter's. Mm-hmm. And we had the dressing room. Elton had the dressing room next to Mick, and we spent a lot of time together. And it was a really special evening, that. And that wasn't a Rolling Stones evening, but it was something Mick and Keith, essentially, you know, it was a Stones event because it was Mick and Keith. They did the they did that song, which was so beautiful. I think they did Miss You as well, didn't they? Yeah, and from what I remember, Keith was a surprise. We knew Mick was going to be there. Yeah. But when Keith came up, it was just beautiful. Uh, and for me, that although it wasn't Rolling Stones per se, it was still Rolling Stones related. Yeah. It was still a big moment. That and the beach at Copacabana Beach was fantastic, you know. I mean, just to see. You know what was so amazing about it? I was out at the sound desk where I always sat with Ethan Russell, and we I looked out to sea, and there were all these boats bobbing around on the ocean listening to the concert from the boats. They all drew alongside of the beach, and there was just loads and loads and loads of boats all listening to the concert. It was a fantastic sight, you know? Well, whoever did the sound for that show, what little I know about PA systems, that strip of beach so long. And well, I forget who was doing I think Ooh. it was, but I've forgotten the sound guy. It was an Irish guy, and I've forgotten his name now. Um, you should know it, because you I, know everything. No, no, no. 
but he deserves a medal because that must have been a nightmare it was great and it was a lovely highlight of working with them i had i had some wonderful years i went around the world with them several times i had great experiences with them i worked very hard i mean when you work with the stones you worked hard because it this was a different period for the band because once michael cole and rupert organized these big stadium shows it was all hard work it was no rock and roll backstage acting right. going on every because mick was doing vocal exercises physical exercise dance exercise he wouldn't go on stage until he'd done his whole routine his health routine you know right, right. so it was like a very a very regimented it was kind of a, a, a regimen you know uh, every night when we went there it was the same thing and, you know maybe afterwards back at the hotel we'd have a people would have a few drinks in the bar and stuff but and then keith always entertained in his suite but i never went so i never knew what <laughs> I, he invited me a few times. He said, "Yo, you must come up. You must," and I never did. <laughs> I never went up. I, I thought that's Keith's territory. It's not my territory. Well, they are the most professional band. I've, you know, and it, it's a testament to the fact that they're still doing it. And Mick is, you know, you you can say what you like about Mick, and some people get have harbor doubts about him. But honestly, I don't harbor any doubts. He is the most brilliant front man ever no question about it charlie always said to me he said i'm i'm looking at his ass going around the world looking at his ass but he's the best front man ever you know absolutely is there any opportunity or any act that you turned down that you regretted not working with or somebody you wanted to work with oh, i've worked with all the best ones i've wanted to work with i love working with elton we speak a lot usually sometimes he calls in the middle of these interviews luckily he didn't call today but um we're still great friends john sadly has passed and mick and i are still friends we swapped christmas cards i went to his christmas party and saw him and we write little emails to each other and he was very happy about my book he sent me a sweet note when the sunday times gave it a great review here and he said oh, i just read your review of your book well done well done and Elton loved the book and he wrote a thing for the front of it. And Andrew Oldham loved the book and he wrote something on the back of it. So I've had universal support for the book. And I haven't upset anybody. And nobody's written to me to say, oh, this is not right. This is inaccurate. Everybody's kind of pleased with it. I'm pleased with it. So it's a very nice period of my life. I do not I, there's not anybody that I feel that I missed out on. I'm completely happy with what I've done and who I've worked with. Thank you very much. <laughs>